Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, which is the, uh, I believe it's the 21st of these Firestarter forums. Um, so we are indeed just about getting the hang of it by now. So uh, the topic today is um, looking forward, um, thinking a little bit about uh, some of the longer term trends uh, and looking into not just 2022, but beyond that. So as always, here's just a quick run through of what we're going to cover in the next um, 75 minutes or so. Um, we should be finished by half past 10. Um, so uh, 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 obviously, uh, we're going to start with some some polls, just just get a bit of a feel for how um, everybody's thinking is, is currently shaped. Um, our main speaker today is um, uh, uh, Paul Feeden, um, uh, a long term uh, uh, associate and friend of ours um, from Gung Ho Communications. Uh, uh, Paul will talk to us a little bit about some of these larger trends that are, are going on um, at the moment, which are, are absolutely fascinating. We'll then do some breakouts and then our kind of typical um, uh, fast starter forum type things such as five minutes interview with uh, one of our forum regulars uh, and then just a little bit of open discussion towards the end of the uh, end of the time together. So um, lots of people have been on these lots of times, but it's always good just to um, remind people how these things work. So you should have been brought on on mute. Um, clearly, uh, when you need to talk, take yourself off mute. Uh, the best thing to do is to be on video, especially during the breakout, so everybody can engage a little bit. Um, the gallery view is generally the best view um, uh, to, to use on your Zoom uh, screen. Uh, breakout sessions, you don't need to do anything. You'll just get taken into those automatically. Uh, and remove from them automatically. Um, and then just generally at any point, please, if you have any questions, thoughts, um, do put them in the chat uh, and Matt, uh, Matt Wheeler will manage uh, manage that as we go through the session. So we are going to start um, with um, some polls um, about this big question, what does the future hold? Um, and the polls today, we have two of them, but they've both got loads of options. So you need to uh, practice your scrolling skills um, to make sure you don't miss any of the options. Otherwise, it will be a slightly distorted uh, response. So um, the first one talks about global issues. Um, and the question is, and this is multiple choice, you can pick as many of these as you want. Um, which of these major global issues are you most concerned about for your business in 2022? Um, so uh, the options include climate change, COVID-19, rising energy stroke, fuel, fuel costs, staff well-being, Brexit, tax rises, technology developments, cyber security. Uh, and then I printed off a version that I can't see the last two on because I'm an idiot, uh, but I'll scroll down on the screen. Um, yeah, in fact, that is it. Those are all the options. So uh, please do vote away. Um, we'll give you just a bit of time to do that. Um, and I can see the result coming in. There's, uh, as you would imagine, uh, quite a mix of um, uh, issues that people are picking up on. Uh, we're probably about 70% of the way through the voting. So just uh, a couple more um, uh, to go. Fine. And now if we just um, show it on the screen, the results, um, you'll see that indeed it's a pretty, as you would expect, um, it generally seems to be the case when we do these type of bowls, a pretty uh, mixed split across all of these. Uh, a slight emphasis still on these topics of staff well-being and COVID-19, uh, COVID actually. So uh, uh, the, the topics that have been very much front and center for a lot of these discussions over the last year and a half. So that is poll one. Um, and I guess uh, as we talk about things going forwards, uh, these, these topics will get uh, different levels of focus. Uh, so poll two um, talks about business planning. Um, same, same idea, there's lots of options that you can pick from. Uh, the question being, uh, which of these key trends are you actively planning for in 2022? Um, and uh, if I just read down the ones, uh, they are, so pick as many as you want, environmental sustainability, new technology advances, the way we work, stroke employee experience, authenticity, uh, increased digitalization, um, uh, cloud-based solutions and remote working, 
hybrid experiences, uh, increased risk of cybersecurity, flatter, more agile business structure. So again, uh, there's a good old mix in there. Um, if, if it's something that you're thinking about, something that you're planning around, um, please uh, just pick them. Um, uh, people are working their way through this well. Um, so again, as I'm seeing the results coming in, uh, not surprisingly, we're getting a really good mix across this. Um, but if nothing else, hopefully what this is doing is just provoking a bit of thinking around some things that maybe ordinarily you wouldn't um, be planning around. Um, so let's uh, let's have a look at the results and the split. Here they come. So again, uh, as you would expect, as I said, a pretty um, balanced mix of these things. Um, and actually the tech and again, the, the, the way people are working are, are continuing to be quite, um, quite dominating in here. So, uh, so excellent. So hopefully just a nice, um, a nice little take the temperature of the room, get people thinking a little bit. Um, what we're going to do now is, um, just before Paul joins us, I'll spend, uh, maybe five, five or six minutes, just perhaps setting the scene a little bit. Um, and just opening up thinking, provoking thinking. This is generally my um, my kind of my purpose in life, actually, or certainly my purpose on these forums. Uh, so I'm not particularly going to talk about the trends, the future trends. That's what Paul's going to talk about. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about our attitude to it, um, our attitude to changing trends uh, as business leaders, business owners, um, and uh, the kind of the how, what does the future hold? That's kind of how long is a piece of string, I guess, that question. Uh, uh, but I'm going to pick at it from three perspectives. So a personal perspective, um, uh, um, the world of work, and also the kind of the whole world around us. Uh, so what are these what are these things telling us? And I, I love a good barometer. Um, and I love the expression kind of the, a good barometer of, of change. And I, I've always kind of used a couple of things uh, personally as like good moments in the year to assess things. Um, so here are a couple of really good examples. So I, I love a work Christmas party. And one of the good things about Fast Data is we do tend to get invited to a lot of um, work Christmas parties. It got a bit out of control at one point, and I think we've just about got it under control. Um, but the Christmas party is always a really good barometer of change because you can look around and you can say, well, who's here? Um, who's new in the last year? Who was here last year? Who wasn't here now? Um, who might not be here uh, next year? Um, so it's a really interesting, what, what, has it, what, what have we achieved since the last time we put these silly hats on? Um, and and I, I always find that really interesting. And Christmas, obviously, is one of those things where people have really, they tend to have really established personal routines as well. So that's another, that's another kind of a, a moment of just pause and reflection. Um, and clearly things are, are, are changing, but a, a lot of, a lot of the, um, the interesting things about it is a lot doesn't change as well. So, um, so th th my next, my next kind of, uh, reference point is, um, today, actually today is Armistice Day, isn't it? And, uh, many of you know, I'm, a um, kind of uh, enthusiastic um trumpet player and and part of the um part of the gig if you're a trumpet player is playing the last post on a regular basis and i've been doing the same last post for for many years in in a village in gloucestershire uh, and every year i look at the the same names on the on the war memorial and uh, do the same bugle call and it, it's a constant and i think it's um I think even if you look around the world now, you see that some of these things that we're, we're remembering and thinking about, like they're unchanged. So even though the, the wars we, co we, we commonly remember are 70 plus, 100 plus years ago, there's still a whole load of stuff going on uh, right now, um, which kind of it, it, it pr proves that not a lot, not a lot actually changes uh, in terms of the way divisions happen, war happens, lives are lost in an instant. So I think there's 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 kind of our generation perhaps doesn't have this monopoly on thinking there's a better place afterwards, uh, and similarly our generation doesn't necessarily have the monopoly on um, on thinking that it's going to perfectly get it right. So I think those are those are interesting things always to reflect on. Um, and the kind of the whole some of the, the cliches, um, like the all the world's a stage, um, all, all the men and women are merely actors having entrances and exits. Those are those are things that uh, that that's the Shakespeare quote, isn't it? Those are things that 
um, have always been true. That's a 500 year quote. Uh, and it's the same. We, we're, we're constantly changing. People are coming through uh, and everybody's just on this earth for a little a little bit of time. So um, really, really kind of like a, a, a good reflection, I guess, on uh, keeping perspective on our, our, our part in change going forwards. Um, so um, also, if we just kind of move on and think a little bit about um, not everything is reliable, not everything can be taken for granted. I can think of several instances, if you look at that Christmas as a barometer of change, where things have been quite surprising uh, and things that you thought were going to stay the same don't stay the same. Uh, I, I know people in this group uh, who've had uh, medical challenges in the last year, things they couldn't have foreseen. I personally have, um, uh, people close to me have had medical challenges, which even this time last Christmas, we never we never would have foreseen. Uh, some, of my, some of my best friends have had those kind of things. So from a personal point of view, keeping your perspective on your, um, your, your role and your attitude to change uh, and adjusting constantly are, are really interesting things. Um, so let's talk a little bit now about the world of work. Um, the classic pivot. Um, uh, so in the last 18 months, lots of people have um, really been uh, talking this language of pivot. Um, but my kind of uh, general observation is that most people have gone off over there, gone off over there, tried new ideas and basically come back to where they where, where they fundamentally were, but perhaps just a bit of a, a kind of version of themselves. Uh, so that that seems to be uh, what 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 is happening generally out there, and there's, there's this great misattributed. Uh, I think it was misattributed to Bill Gates quote, um, which what has happened in the last eighteen months has been a correction. Uh, so hopefully that that's a good that's a good thing to to have happened. Um, these two images here, we always show these images when we're we're doing um, sales training. Um, to make the point, um, so this is one of the kind of the seven habits that we talk to people about when we do sales training. Uh, and these two images we've been using for probably 15 years, actually, um, uh, to make the point that actually um, lots changes, but lots doesn't change. So um, we picked two completely culturally different environments. So 1960s New York and still in 1960s New York, there were people who were doing it better, people who were being more commercially successful than other people. If you look at if you look at the market scene in, in, in the second image, somewhere in that market will be somebody who's absolutely knocking it out of the park in terms of the way they're organizing what they're doing. Uh, somewhere there will be people who are struggling and doing it less well. So kind of Everything changes, but lots doesn't change, and I think that's a a really um, a really important kind of message when you're thinking about um, uh, longer term trends and your your approach to them. Um, so finally, um, we just talk a little bit about the world around us. Um, so I'm 49. Uh, I know that's amazing. I look much younger. Uh, 49 going on 50 next birthday. Um, and keeping up with everything is is quite hard. I'm I'm not going to lie. Um, and there's a classic. Um, uh, uh, many of you will have seen this. Uh, it probably 10, 15 years ago. There was a classic. Um, Dara Dara O'Brien. I should be able to say that. Um, uh, the comedian sketch when he talked about technology, um, and he said technology is like running with someone who is significant, or keeping up with technology is like running with someone who's significantly fitter than you. Uh, so you start off and you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I can keep up, I can keep up, uh, and then they start just turning the pace on a little bit, and you go, yeah, I can keep up, I can keep, I can keep up with this, uh, and then like they, you just say, I'm just going to let you go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and it is a bit like that. And, and, and so this is this is part of the, I guess, the mindset around change and trends that, that are, are moving on. We have to work out when when it's right for us to absolutely go with it and when it's right for us just to say, OK, we're going to let that one pass. Um, so that kind of really brings me to my, my sort of end point of this. Uh, my daughter reminded me of this quote the other day, which I think is an all time classic. Uh, so like like everything, it's about judgment, it's about balance, it's about deciding what do I go with, what don't I go with. Um, and uh, I, I just thought this was quite a nice, uh, it's been, again, this has been misattributed to lots of different people, um, but it, it's quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting perspective on things. So I will just, before we uh, go to Paul, I'll just kind of summarize a little bit kind of uh, on this intro. So my, my, my slot here really was just to maybe provoke people a little bit to think about, okay, so, 
how how am I reacting to longer term trends? What is my position on it? Um, so my, my my conclusions are having sort of some good barometers of change is a really useful thing. So like reflecting, take take the slower slower moving trends is a really interesting to look like. So what does it look like at Christmas? Uh, uh, this year, what did it look like at Christmas last year? What did it look like at Christmas last year? Uh, sorry, next year, last year. Um, the whole kind of like we're we're here just for a period of time. The classic French saying uh, "plus a change," which means basically uh, the more things change, the more the same they are, which is so true. Uh, just expect the unexpected, keep perspective, and generally kind of make make decisions about how you adapt to this world around you. So. Um, the purpose of that really was just to set scene, just to get people to a point where they're thinking, um, how do I react to change? I'm now um, uh, delighted that in a, in a second, I'm going to be joined by Paul. I'll tell you a little bit about Paul um, just before uh, he comes up on the screen. Um, so uh, Paul is the um, CEO of Gung Ho Communications, which is a communications agency uh, working across PR, social, um, and experiential in the sports, in mainly the sports and lifestyle sector. Um, he works with a, a number of high profile brands such, such as New Balance, uh, Quicksilver, Speedo, LS and Canterbury, uh, and has worked on some really big events such as Rugby World Cup, World Swimming Championships, London Marathon and the Olympic Games. And currently um, they're working on the 2022 um, Commonwealth Games in Birmingham. Uh, prior to Gung Ho, Paul was the global marketing director at Speedo um, for, for nine years and, and has worked in lots of marketing agencies as well. So a guy that really knows his stuff and, it, um, and we were really, um, I, I guess, um, privileged to work with Paul uh, with a couple of clients. So uh, without further ado, here is Paul. Hello, Paul. How are you? Good morning. Very well. How are you? Uh, I'm very well. I'm very well indeed. So um, I'm just going to let you get on, Paul. I think the thing that the reason why we thought you were a great person to do this was uh, two or three years ago, you said to us that you actually engaged someone to particularly look at future trends. Uh, and it was a big part of what you did at Gung Ho. Um, so um, you can tell people a little bit about that uh, later. But uh, I think you had a virtually a mystic Meg on your books at one point. Yeah. <laughs> She's still with us. <laughs> so yeah, absolutely. Uh, who would have yeah. thought that? So, okay, so I will hand over to you, Paul, and uh, off you go. Thank you, Chris, thank you. So um, yeah, thanks very much for that intro and uh, hello to everybody. Um, we are a sport fashion lifestyle agency, as Chris mentioned, and as part of our role there, and particularly with the brands that we're working with, it's really important for us to keep looking forward and keep trying to kind of see what's coming through as trends, and understand where we can counsel the, the clients that we're working with, but also to help shape our own organization. So as Chris mentioned, um, she's not called Meg, she's called Geraldine, our mystic Meg. Um, she's actually a futurist. And um, yes, she wears a lot of silver, which is um, kind of interesting. But her role completely is to com look at the future, look at trends, look at what's happening and really bring it to the fore and help us shape strategy around it. So this is a report uh, which I'm going to share with you today. So it's not about general trends. Um, whilst I've got a touch on that at the end of the presentation, it's really about what we're talking about um, in, is a, as a major trend that we've seen coming through with the help of Geraldine is transparency. And you're going to be seeing a lot more about being a transparent business. So really, this presentation is just talking about that. Um, but I will share some of the trends with you at the end. And there's some references that we'll put in the chat so you can have the full report from us as well and also another trend report. Um, but uh, you know, bear with me on this presentation because it's just an extract of the main presentation. So there's lots of words, but I'm not gonna read it all. I'm just gonna sort of reference key points in there. And really the key point here around transparency, I think around two to five years, brands, businesses, corporations are going to be far more accountable. We all are, whether we're big businesses, whether we're SMEs, that's actually gonna be happening. And I think it's already happening. So there are watchdogs, whether that's government, whether that's uh, institutions, particularly customers and consumers, we're going to be absolutely more accountable. So moving on to the next slide. Um, these are the chapters that are in the report. I'm just going to touch on each one very briefly with you. Um, and that we do have other reports as well that I can share. But as I say, this one's really just focused on the sort of transparency kind of trend that's coming through. So if we just move on to the next one. 
the first kind of key point and chapter in the in the report that we've developed, but which we kind of finished, I think, around uh, six months ago, and we shared it with many of our clients who are already acting on this, is really around this performative um, kind of approach in terms of performative activism or marketing. So the chapter is called Stop Being Hungry, Stop Being Performative. Many of you may have heard that phrase coming through. I think it's really about getting the so-called glory of activism without having to pay any price is a major challenge. So really the point around this presentation, this chapter, is that brands have made recently many promises, whether that's around environmental issues or social justice. And in fact, a big, big example of that was Black Lives Matter, where a lot of brands wanted to act on that, be involved and support it, made lots of claims, but actually now, they're actually being called out because they're not following those through. So it's really important to really back up what you promise. That's the key point here. And if we just move on to the next slide, there's a really interesting quote on this slide, which says corporations wield such power, in some cases, more power than a small country. People quite rightly are holding them accountable because they, how they do business has an outsized impact on people and communities. So it's really coming down to that spotlight I think big corporations are obviously feeling more of the heat now, particularly as we come out of COP, you're going to see a lot of that. But I think this will trickle down in the next few years. So everybody is going to be, we're all going to be more accountable about what we say, what we do, how we change and how we look forward. Moving on to the next chapter. I'm oh, sorry, and each one, in each chapter as well, actually, we will give you some takeaways to sort of act on. So for example, in the first chapter, you said, be transparent with your diversity initiative. That's a big theme that's relevant to our industry. Make your diversity and inclusion goals public, share regular detailed updates, or indeed reprioritize the voices of employees and partnerships and map out and navigate your organization's future with them. And that's something we're trying to do as, a, as an agency as well. So the next chapter is authentic versus aspirational. So this is really more, as we move on, spotlight on allyship so allyship doesn't only pertain to like lgbt people of color people with disabilities women's rights but actually it really comes down to a lot around greenwashing obviously a, a big word we've been hearing particularly recently now um this is about avoiding greenwashing because really there's two trends that have come out uh, recently um, a lot of businesses and corporations are making claims focused on minor issues that satisfy a popular soundbite in the public without accompanying meaningful action. Really, really, you know, easy to do, but you can fall into a trap. And the second is campaigning and, and advertising a product's positive environmental performance while hiding its negative impacts. That will be discovered and that will be called out. So again, back to meaningful action. So if we just move forward on the next one and the next one, there's some takeaways here. So for example, stop equating social justice posts with social and climate justice action, or indeed pair symbolic actions with meaningful action via time, financial and human centric investments. So a lot more detail around that, but uh, if you look at the actual whole report, but some really interesting things that come out of this. On to the third chapter. Chris mentioned sort of slow and easing down. Slow marketing is something we've seen coming through and, and a focus on education. So really, this is um, really focusing on if we move on. There's a real focus on um, actual educating the consumer, educating com com customers around transparency, around what it takes to make a product, around what it takes to deliver a service. So it's permeating now. We're seeing in a lot of campaigns uh, where some brands that are really transparent actually sharing a lot of that education in what goes into delivering what they do a lot more. And actually, I think individuals, groups uh, and customers are actually asking for that as well. So just some examples, if you move on to the next slide. This is an example I can give you. It's a really great example, actually. Um, on the right there, you'll see this is an actual Instagram post from a brand called Haeckel's. Now, Haeckel's is a sustainable beauty brand, um, and their whole premise is around being as transparent as possible because they want absolute trust with their consumers. So a really interesting post. Um, they posted this in June 2021, um, which is what we stating we want to be the most transparent business in the world. Um, so this is a beauty product. And what they did in that post, really interesting, is they shared the, app, the cost of every component, including the profit 
are what it takes to deliver that product and make that product. And that's everything from the label, the bag, the plastic recycled lid, the glass pot, all the vitamins and everything that goes in the product, the R&D and the people cost. So, you know, actually, I think this is now very early days, but we'll start a bit of a trend where we'll see a lot more transparency coming through in communications. So a really interesting move by them. They are heralded as kind of a really transparent brand. And I know a lot of the brands that we talk to are looking at them. Moving on. Some takeaways there, I think really around, um, you know, provide some educational tools for employees to learn the skills they need to act on social justice and engage in inclusive conversations and create campaigns and services which really embed education in a creative way. And then chapter four is be aligned. So really there's a growing number of initiatives as we move forward into the next slide. There's a growing number of uh, initiatives putting corporations on the record with their commitments um, and putting this principle of radical transparency at the, at the forefront. Kind of very kind of like, you know, uh, a lot of kind of convoluted words, but actually um, the days of accountability are, are here. And I think the way that we look at this is that there are lots of independent initiatives that are really bringing it to the fore. So whether it's carbon emissions, water consumption, profit margins, salaries of workers, technology is emerging as one of the best ways to track organizations as well as allow them to share their eco performance in real time. So on the next slide, there's a couple of examples, actually. Um, we're aware of a, a sustainable fashion brand, that's the sector we're in, called Sant. And they let customers scan a QR code on a garment's label to find out in real time information on the item's carbon neutralization, which is like absolute transparency. Uh, and there's a fintech company called Deconomy. You may have come across them. They're the world's first credit card with a carbon footprint, footprint limit. It's called Do Black. And it's in collaboration with MasterCard. So it provides a cap for consumers, which cuts them off when they reach their yearly carbon allowance. So it's like really getting into available transparency and actually acting on it. So, you know, really, really important. The other thing here is digital declaration. Uh, it's a list of aspirational principles and commitments signed by more than 80 corporate leaders. It's worth having a look. So it's designed as a guideline for companies wanting to build consumer trust, equality, transparency, and transparency into the future of their brands. So some of the takeaways here, uh, one, for example, is establish what transparency means to your organization in order to properly formulate a data-driven action plan. And then really the actual final uh, chapter here, and the next slide is damned if you do, damned if you don't. So just moving on. So <clears throat> it's really being about uh, being clean and open. So there's a lot of pressure. I think we've all felt it. Um, certainly in my sector, I've seen it a lot to take a stand on social and climate justice and act accordingly. But what that's actually um, driven is greenwashing and a bit of woke washing. Um, and actually there's a fear of backlash around doing that now. So if we just move on to the next slide, something which I think is uh, a really interesting that's come through is that um, we've just looked at some research, Edelman's 2020 Trust Barometer, you can get access to that online. And it's a report based on surveys involving more than 34,000 global respondents. And it found that a strong majority of employees want their CEOs to speak out on issues, including income equality, inequality, diversity, and climate change. So this is where the pressure is now coming on leaders in organizations to be transparent from within, as well as being outward with customers and consumers. So it's a really interesting move. And we're seeing that in communications. So really a couple of takeouts, design your regulations, your ethics, your company culture, and be explicit about that. And ensure performance reviews, assess whether leadership and members of teams, as well as suppliers are cultivating a culture of equity and inclusion. So that kind of wraps the, um, the presentation and the report that we um, have just delivered. We're working on our next one already, which I'll share with you uh, at some point in the near future. But I just wanted to touch on overall trends as well. So I have shared this in the chat with you. It's from Trend Hunter. And they've identified six key opportunities and 10, 18 mega trends. I'm not going to take you through them all. Um, but as I say, I've also given you a, a link to this. It's really interesting because they've got lots of great examples. So for example, some of the mega trends that they've identified and we're kind of familiar with is youthfulness. The world is becoming more playful driven by generations not ready to grow up. I definitely buy into that. 
um, experience. We all want to buy more experiences um, and seeing that more as a priority. Gamification, um, absolute growth. We, we're actually getting a lot of our clients invest in that. So it's the application of gaming dynamics in real world, solving real world problems or generally how you kind of like develop solutions. So, um, and, and, and I think you're definitely probably seeing a lot more of that coming through. So take a look. I think it's really interesting. You'll get a lot from it and happy to share any more details with you. I can share my contact details. We've got a lot more reports around future trends as well and hope that's of use. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Really, really interesting, actually. Uh, and I, uh, I'm sure that's going to provoke quite a bit of um, thinking as we go through. Uh, my, my kind of, as I was listening, I was thinking it's really interesting because basically the, the two conclusions I drew from what you were talking about were like e fundamentally everything is under the spotlight, isn't it? Um, um, const constantly now, and I think that's probably a product of um, kind of it's consumer power that's driven through the the ease the ease with which people can express an opinion like so social media especially all kinds of feedback mechanics so the uh, the ability for for a voice to grow really quickly is, is definitely there now so that's kind of that whole everything under the spotlight mm -hmm. is is a really interesting thing which means that if there's something that is um kind of on vogue as a as a topic then actually you need to you you need to be on it and actually almost what you're saying uh, with some of the with the comments is it's almost worse to pay lip service to something than not to do anything at all about it so, so it's uh, yeah lots that i'm sure that's going to drive some really interesting um conversations and paul if it's okay with you when we when we uh, once we've done the breakouts we'll invite you back um onto the screen um to to sort of talk to people um, when when we when we go through the kind of the feedback from the teams. So uh, for now, Paul, thank you uh, very much indeed, sir. Um, so what we're going to do now um, uh, is we are going to go into the breakouts. So um, straightforward principle, um, we'll put you into breakout groups of somewhere between three and um, probably six um, uh, for uh, 20 minutes. We, there's a topic which I'll explain in a moment. Um, you should find that you have a a fire starter facilitator in the room with you um, who will make themselves known to you if you happen to end up in a room without a facilitator then if somebody uh, could be good enough to uh, to take that mantle that would be great um, as always the points we make with this is just be careful not to spend 20 minutes introducing yourself um, do try and talk about the topic uh, and just keep an eye on time uh, because we will bring you back at the end of it so the topic um, for this discussion, or, or really the prompt for discussion, uh, is 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 the these two points here. So specifically, what and, and think a little bit about um, uh, some of the stuff we talked about at, with the polls right at the beginning. Uh, some of the things that Paul's just been talking about. So, what are the most important trends for your business in 2022? And I think it's important just to go a level up. So don't don't just think absolutely micro your business but think about what the, the world around you is telling you um but then um what specific tactics and initiatives um have you started stroke will be starting to address these trends so uh so i'm i'm sure um following um paul's um uh, presentation there, there's there's lots of things going around in people's minds um so uh, without further ado we will put you into the breakout rooms facilitators please do uh, remember to send uh, your thoughts uh, through to matt um uh, towards the end of the breakout stroke in the in the first few minutes after the breakout uh, to help us organize the the session at the end so uh, enjoy your time and we'll see you in um 20 minutes Hi everybody, welcome back. I'm sure you had some um, interesting uh, conversations. I could uh, I could actually see uh, at one point, I could see Matt and um, Paul uh, from another view. I won't bore you with the details and they both were very engaged with their breakout rooms. So hopefully their breakout rooms will indeed uh, confirm that in due course. Um, so just a quick reminder, um, facilitators, if you could um, in the next five minutes or so, just uh, compile a bit of feedback um, send it through to uh, Matt Wheeler uh, in the chat and anybody else actually if you want to if you want to uh, mention anything that you think was particularly important please do drop that into the chat to Matt talking of the chat you will also see now um, uh, already some of the um, Paul's reports are 
uh, appearing in the chat. So uh, feel free to download those, but we will make sure we send those out afterwards as well. So um, uh, that five minutes I just talked about uh, gives us a, a an excellent opportunity um, to uh, welcome back one of our favorite features, the five minutes um, with um, uh, slot, um, where our, our long-term friend, Mr. Dave Harries, um, interviews a, uh, a random uh, member of the Firestarter community. Uh, and I won't steal his thunder, um, but this gentleman, um, uh, two points about this gentleman. Um, uh, number one, every time I see him, he looks funkier. Um, so, uh, like I've known this guy for probably 10, 12 years and he just seems to be getting younger, uh, which isn't allowed. Um, and, uh, and secondly, he is one of the absolute kind of stalwarts of the fast starter forums, uh, came to most of the early ones and has been coming, uh, lots ever since. So he's probably got, uh, if this was a McDonald's, um, and you had little badges for each forum that you came to, uh, or stars, he'd probably have, uh, approaching approaching 21. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dave Harris um, and uh, let you do your five minutes with. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, welcome to five minutes with and our guest today, our random funky guest, as Chris described him, is Ben Thomas, who I hope is going to join me on the screen. Hello, Ben. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, very Good. well. Excellent. Ben is a real estate lawyer and a partner at Harrison Clark Rickabies, where he's been for nearly three years. He's based in Cheltenham, uh, in their Cheltenham office. But his secret weapon, uh, when I looked on LinkedIn, is that he went to school in Aberystwyth. So let's find out a little bit more about your background, Ben. So uh, tell me about how you got from the deepest, darkest depths of Mid Wales to, uh, to uh, being a partner in a law firm in Cheltenham. Yeah, that's right. So uh, I am. I'm. I'm. I'm from uh, Aberystwyth in in West Wales. Um, I uh, I suppose the romantic view is that uh, my my dad's a solicitor back in Aberystwyth. My mum is a qualified barrister, although she doesn't uh, she doesn't uh, doesn't work as a barrister now. And my grandpa, who, as it happens, was born on Armistice Day in 1918, and his name was William Armistice Bowen. So he was also a solicitor. So the romantic view is that I, I followed them into the law. The, 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 the sort of slightly lazy view is that I probably had decent enough grades and a, and a quite a narrow uh, viewed uh, career advisor who said, you either want to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I thought, well, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't really like blood too much. So I'll, I'll go off and do law. So I went to Bristol. I did uh, a law degree. I then did my legal practice course and I ended up in Cheltenham in 2003. Uh, where I did my so, training contract at BPE solicitors. So wh when you were growing up in, in Aberystwyth, I mean, did, did you think about what you wanted to do when you were grown up? And did you have a particular ambition? Um, I think probably uh, like most young young boys and, and girls, I, I I played quite a lot of sport and I, I, I really liked uh, golf. And I thought maybe I was going to be a professional golfer and I won a couple of tournaments and then I went off to a, a sort of... Uh, a Welsh national tournament and I realised that I was a, a, a small fish when it came to that. So I think quite quite quickly I started concentrating on school instead. It's a, Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you can think you're doing really well and then, as you say, you get chucked into the big pond and uh, mm. you realise that, oh, actually, there's a lot of good people who are good at this. And I'm sure that's particularly <laughs> true of golf and as well as all sports. So um, tell me a little bit about being a real estate lawyer. I mean, what's the best thing about that? Oh, uh, I suppose it's probably not reading 80 page leases day in, day out. I mean, what I, I, I think that's what people think I do. And, and to some extent, they're, they're right. I mean, uh, when it comes to property, I don't tend to do residential property. The firm does, uh, but we have specialist teams who do, do other areas of law. But when it comes to property, it's, it's very varied. You know, every day is different. Um, we've got a, a, a big team of people and it's interacting with them. Obviously, that was did more challenging during COVID, but you know, we did very well. We were agile. We, we, we worked from home after the first weekend and it didn't really affect things. Um, and, and luckily since then we've, we've managed to keep hold of, uh, pretty much everyone as well. So, um, I, I, it's just interacting with people, whether that's clients or, or colleagues. Yeah. I'm interested you mentioned COVID there because I was wondering whether, you know, do, do you see an effect that COVID has had on real estate, you know, commercial real estate? Because, you know, with a lot more people working at home, presumably the demand for office space 
one might imagine has has dropped a little. I mean, have you seen a trend like that? Um, the, 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 I wouldn't say a trend necessarily. I mean, I only saw this morning on the on the headlines that Admiral Insurance are are consolidating a lot of their properties in South Wales, so they look like they're going to you know be closing offices with a view to people working from home. But we were just discussing this in the breakout. I think you know there's a real risk going forward about mental health issues and health and well-being of of staff um, and we've certainly seen that and and the flip side of that is um, our Cheltenham office has just undergone a, a refurb um, you know we spent a lot of money as a business uh, making sure it's a, it's a good place to work for people to come back into um, and I'm seeing the results on that straight away I mean we're, we're phase we finished phase one of three so one of the floors has been finished um, and it's still a work in progress but you know, people are people are coming back into the office. We've got the sort of water cooler conversations in kit, in the new kitchen, and it's just nice to see people who we haven't seen for sometimes you know month and month and month. Yeah, and on, and and in the short time we got left, um, Ben, what what about the future? You know, how do you see it going forward? What's the next eighteen months going to look like? I mean, I hope I hope there is more of. I think it's it's a balance. Um, I said this again in the breakout. It's it's got to be a balance, and it's such a subjective thing, both for people, you know, individuals, and the business itself. It it depends. You know, some businesses will flourish working from home, and that's fine. But we 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 started using Teams, and that's a great great tool to use. But I hope it's it's more balanced because I think towns need people to return back into towns to use the the services, the restaurants, the bars, and and and. Therefore, you don't really want people just sitting at home, even though technology allows for it. Yeah, well, maybe the future is hybrid. Let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that we can find that balance. Uh, ben Thomas, thank you very much for joining us for Five Minutes With. And now I'm going to hand you back to Chris at Firestarter HQ. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, really interesting. It's always great just to hear people's backstory. I'd forgotten you were an Aberystwyth boy. Uh, my... My wife is an Aberystwyth girl, so uh, having lived in lots of different places in the UK, the, the only thing I can confirm is that it doesn't matter where you come from, Aberystwyth is a real bugger to get to. Uh, so, uh, but a lovely, lovely place when you get there. Um, so, uh, fantastic. So that's um, that's uh, really interesting and we'll continue to do this. It, it's just really nice to get to know a little bit more about people um, who, who join us on a regular basis and, and, and find a little bit uh, more out about their, their worlds. So um, what we're going to do now, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to invite Matt onto the screen, uh, who hopefully uh, by now has been able to uh, bring together, <laughs> look at that face, uh, bring together <laughs> some thoughts. That, that face either means there's not a lot or there's rather a lot, yeah? Uh, so which one is it? There's a lot, but it's coming in thick and fast now as we talk. So I'm going to have to act quickly and uh, and just kind of. Uh, okay, people uh, I will. Uh, I will use. As I will go. be. I will be chief padder. <laughs> yeah, whilst you uh, whilst you read stuff. Yeah. So okay, if you've got something so, to start, yeah. Yeah. So um, I in in my group we we talked um, a, a bit about the the speed of change and um, picking up on some of the things that that you mentioned earlier, Chris, about the, the cyclical nature of. Uh, um sort of how things are changing and uh, um we had um, sort of roger press in our, our group who um, is particularly struggling with um speed of change in the in the music industry and how the the kind of digital trends and streaming and the power of of the the big boys in that marketplace are are uh, controlling that market and it makes it very difficult for the smaller operators to to find a way in so you know that's a that's a real real challenge um, then we also had um, Kate Brown in the events industry, who was um, um, basically saying that COVID is still a massive issue in, in that, that particular marketplace. And, and the way in which um, she's having to run her business, um, certainly with the briefs that she's taking, is, is managing different scenarios. So it, it's not just about um, taking a brief for a face to face event now. It's about taking a brief for an event. And if we can't do that event, then what do we do as a contingency? And it's you're looking at three or four different scenarios and it's very unpredictable and uh, and leaves her being very vulnerable in terms of how uh, how she can run a business um the other thing we we did talk about was um uh, the the trend in diversity um and roger raised the point that you know there, there's a, a big trend in the rise in in uh, of, of women in power um you know globally you know bit women in some really sort of big positions uh, um throughout the world that's a really positive change and the point that um, 
you know, immigration is is also you know a, a really good thing for for business because uh, I think um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Roger. Hopefully I got this right, but in, in the US, forty percent of the uh, um, uh, business leaders are uh, in the US corporations are, are immigrants or um, children of immigrants. So you know, therefore that that has a really sort of big impact on on the global economy. So all good stuff there. Um, then um, I think um, I'd like to um, bring on Piotr Radziki because um, he is talking about the challenges that he's facing. He runs a training business um, and he's having a real challenge with uh, the rise of digital and uh, um, sort, of, sort of transitioning from uh, um, the face to face type um, uh, sort of challenges through to, to running some, um, some digital uh, uh, sort of training and and how that becomes uh, uh, is becoming a big trend and actually something that we're we're stuck with that that actually is is going to continue for for the years to come. So uh, they are Piot. Um, uh, did I explain that correctly? <laughs> um, almost. Uh, I'm I'm representing um, Turbo Change, so it tends to be Colin who's my boss uh, that's here. But we're a small team of three, and the rest was absolutely spot on. Um, so. Colin's been in the business for 25 years and he's always worked face to face. Um, and now, well, over, over COVID, the business just had a really bad time. I joined Colin in March and we've decided that the best way to move forward for us was to kind of streamline our services and see what could, what we could deliver online. The issue is some aspects of what we do um are easier to deliver online than others for example things like business development academy uh which is all based on training um training people to to become good work winners that's easier because you can create that as a as an online course there's a bunch of theory a bunch of exercises weekly meetings um and that's quite easy to deliver because it's largely self-driven but culture change work and, and business strategy work where you have to have 30 people on a call, that's it becomes far less feasible on, on Zoom because of the social interactions and how they take place. Um, taking into account the fact that you get extroverts that are more than happy to take up you know, the entirety of the call and people that are more introverted who, who might not get heard, but their ideas are just as valuable, if not more. Um, so we are looking at shifting parts of that online and it, whether that's feasible and the value is still there, or if it has to remain, you know, we travel wherever you are and then deliver that program to, to you. So there's a lot of, a lot of thinking, a lot of guessing and a lot of trying things out, um, just to get the right balance. The, um, the, the thing that I'm, as I'm hearing that I, and listen, and also listening to Paul, who we should get back on, um, um, in, in a minute, actually, Matt, if there's some specific things re related to, to Paul, but, um, the, the thing I'm hearing is that it feels like this, that, like the big conclusions I've got from this session today are firstly, the shadow of COVID just really still looms massively large, doesn't it? And I think everybody remains, um, I guess uh ambiguous as how to best continue to to learn from that for the future exactly as you're describing kind of like it, it's 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 e even post pandemic which we are not post pandemic the way people want to integrate and operate is changing isn't it because they've learned some new things so that's a that's a big thing uh, and then just and i don't know whether it's coincidental or 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 or, or a consequence the whole thing around actually uh, maybe maybe because people have, have become more digital this whole kind of digital accountability for kind of um uh things that are, are deemed to be key topics has increased massively as well all the things paul was saying so it's really it's really interesting actually um so so yeah uh, we we share your pain with our own work actually we know exactly exactly how it how how, how you're feeling so uh so yeah, so thank you very much indeed. Really good to have you on. Uh, Matt, oh, Thanks. back to you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Um, so um, I'd actually like to go to Brian James next, who operates in a, um, a similar brand world to Paul actually. And um, he picked up on, on the fact that, uh, you know, people are much more aware of what they want and they're much bolder in their decision-making now. So um, yeah, that that, um, that obviously has an impact on, on how, uh, 
uh, how we're, we're sort of talking to people. And I think that the kind of the, the, the idea of being genuine and making sure that everyone buys into your ethos and your business, I think is important, you know, that people people are now the product and it's, it's not just a question of, uh, of selling things. You, you've got to really sort of focus on, on, on values and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and sort of the, the kind of emotional attachment to people, to products as well. So, um, Brian, just be good to sort of touch on that. And in, I guess, in the context of what Paul was talking about with the and maybe get Paul back, if you can get Paul back as well, um, just, yeah, that would be good, perfect. Yeah. look at that. We've gone to yeah. four people. Love it. Look at that. Great. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, Max. Yeah, I think it's an interesting one, isn't it? It's this kind of the perception of the brand first and foremost, and uh, I think one of the kind of key key drivers is to be genuine. And we always say from the heart to the heart. And I think if they can kind of uh, take that approach, but what I found fascinating in terms of uh, what uh, Paul was talking about, which was brilliant, absolutely fantastic. Now, when it's a consumer brand, by the very nature of the beast, I think most people understand there's a lot of kind of moving parts in terms of its price, in terms of uh, what it kind of how it makes you feel and all of those things. But in the world of business to business, I think that's much more tricky to capture all of that in some shape and form, because ultimately it's the people that are the product. <laughs> So unlike a bit, uh, unlike a consumer product, which fundamentally is the outward manifestation, whether or not it's a pair of shoes or it could be a washing machine or a TV or whatever it might be, then all of a sudden people kind of kind of they, they attach that product to the brand, whilst invariably it's it's the people within the services industry, which is as important in terms of how do you capture and make that emotional connection uh, right. when it's people and Probably that comes down to culture. Indeed. Paul, any any quick responses to that? I'm conscious we're buffering <laughs> up on time, but any quick responses to that, Paul? Yeah, for sure. I think absolutely valid point. What I would say is even if it's a service, it's the values and behavior of that business we, we really what will stand out and, and cut through. So that's kind of really um, the focus and how people will respond to you in that sense. So whilst there might not be a physical product, Values and behaviour will be how um, you know the brand, could, the business could be judged. Brilliant. Yeah, totally um, so, um, as always, time is our enemy on these forums. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to say thank you to everybody. So, thank you very much indeed um, to uh, everybody that's <laughs> fed back um, uh, from the uh, from the floor. I appreciate we haven't had an opportunity to do much. Paul, um, thank you so much. Really interesting. I'm sure that. <laughs> Um, I'm sure that people will read the report um, with with interest, and I think um, just some big topics in there um, in terms of accountability, transparency, uh, uh, being genuine, all those kind of things. So massively, uh, massively interesting. Thank you very much to Paul, uh, Matt. Um, as always, thank you very much for your. Uh, they're playing with me. They're taking Bye. people off the screen one by one. I'm loving it. Uh, uh, Matt, uh, thank you very much for your contributions today. Uh, Dave Harries and Ben Thomas, thank you very much indeed as well. Um, all that really remains to um, be said is uh, uh, please do, do keep coming to these forums, keep spreading the word. Um, if you've got ideas for topics that you would like us to um, cover, please do just share them with us. I mean, every every month, uh, something comes out of the previous months, which drives another round of conversation. Remember last time we were talking about B Corps, uh, this time we're talking about perhaps um, some of the longer term trends that that's driving. So please do keep talking to us, giving us ideas, and we will keep going. Um, but without you, there wouldn't be us. So thank you very much. Please do keep coming. Uh, and we will see you next month. Thanks very much, everybody. I'm off to go and play the last post. <laughs>